months ago when I uh, started to put this panel together, I, I naturally thought of David Goodman as, as moderator. Um, I, I actually first met uh, David when I, I hired him as a technical expert in a patent lawsuit. Um, and it's actually uh, David's technical analysis uh, that allowed us to put together uh, what it turned out to be winning arguments both at the Manhattan District Court, uh, Federal District Court here, as well as the uh, um, uh, Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit, which hears all patent cases uh, uh, and, and appeals. So um, David, of course, he's got, uh, and as, as I knew you know, when I hired him uh, three or four years ago, you know, he's got more than 40 years of experience in, in wireless technology, um, extremely uh, long view of, of a technology that's constantly changing. Um, he's, he was head of the Bell Labs uh, radio research uh, department, and he's now professor emeritus at uh, the Polytechnic Institute of NYU. Uh, among his honors are membership in the uh, National Academy of Engineering and the UK's Royal Academy of Engineering, and he's a uh, fellow of the IEEE. I'd like you to welcome uh, Professor David Goodman. Thanks very much. That's very kind. I'm not going to be as kind to the panelists. Uh, what I propose to do is uh, introduce each panelist just by name and affiliation and let them say a few words about what they do, what, what's their, each one, uh, each person's participation in uh, broadband wireless. And uh, then we'll go from there. We're going to try to uh, uh, judge what the audience is interested in. And uh, so please, if you, if you have any questions, I'll try to pay attention and see if I can work them into, into the discussion. So I said that uh, I would introduce the, the panelists in random order, and I still haven't figured out what that is. But the first name I see on my program is Frank Bulban, and he's from Light Squared. So Frank, would you lead off for us, please? Um, I'm Frank Bulban. Uh, I've not been in wireless for 40 years, only 20 years, uh, with the second GSM carrier in France, SFR, then with Orange, and then with Vodafone. And I joined Light Squared uh, a bit over a year ago as the second employee. And the reason why I joined Light Squared is that I found the business model fascinating. We are the first ever wholesale only wireless carrier in the world and we are going to do that wholesale only business model with 4G LTE and satellite complemented on our network, integrated on our network and we will be selling our capacity on a per gigabyte basis to existing carriers who haven't got spectrum or enough of it or haven't got it nationwide. We'll be also selling it to retailers. We've signed Best Buy as an example already to device manufacturers and to web players. So if you want to uh, first remember two words about Light Squared, it's wholesale only. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'll, I'll ask Bart Stuck to uh, carry on from here. Hi, I'm uh, with Signal Lake, which is a venture fund in Westport, Connecticut, in Boston. And we invest in, among other things, wireless uh, business opportunities. We uh, involvement with wireless goes back to the middle 80s when uh, this was first getting going. So if uh, trying to think of the most provocative thing in 1996, I invested in a company called Ensemble Communications, which developed some modulation schemes that we call WiMAX today. Okay, And they ended up uh, targeting New York City and had a $300 million contract with Windstar through Alcatel-Lucent, as an example. So uh, when it comes to uh, wireless, the, the things that we see compelling here, why, why this is an interesting area, is the, the nature of infrastructure and communications is historically you had high fixed costs and low variable costs. That the, you had to dig the ground up, put conduit in, pull cables through it, uh, with wireless, you put a couple towers up and you can broadcast everybody and the fixed costs are much less and as you get more customers, you add them, you put more radios in so your expenses start to track your revenue. So it's a very compelling business model. Um, so what we see happening here that will be very disruptive in the next five years is very low cost 
base stations. These will be things the size of toaster ovens. They'll be priced at $10,000 and less, and they'll be the things that you'll see hanging on poles all over the place, and they'll be the things providing your voice, data, and video services going forward in time. I'll, I'll introduce uh, Chuck Dutour next since he's selling these base stations for a few hundred thousand dollars each right now. <laughs> uh, well, that's a problem. <laughs> if they're going, go, going to go down to 10,000, that's going to be a problem. But um, Hi, everybody. So uh, my name is Jack Jitur. Uh, my background has been in uh, uh, deployment of wireless networks. Uh, uh, across the globe, I have uh, deployed large-scale, uh, I have led deployment of large-scale wireless networks uh, in emerging markets like India, uh, in Asia-Pacific, and in the U.S. Currently, I'm based in Canada, and I'm looking after, uh, you know, the technical support, the deployment, and, uh, you know, uh, basically all services related to uh, build-up of wireless and wireless networks in Canada. Uh, Alcatel Lucent, uh, as Bart mentioned, is one of the leading equipment providers in the world. And uh, surprisingly, we have three affiliations on this bo uh, panel right now with Alcatel Lucent. Bell Labs, the <coughs> famous Bell Labs are part of Alcatel Lucent. David and Bart both yeah, have yeah. affiliations with Bell Labs. Yeah. We're there together. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. And uh, I'll ask <coughs> Amy Spiegel next. Uh, Sure. In NYC Wireless? Uh, so I, I feel kind of out of place only because the sort of business that, that uh, I do with NYC Wireless is actually tremendously different from the sorts of uh, businesses that, that my, my fellow panelists are on. Uh, you know, there, when you talk about wireless broadband, there's really three types of wireless broadband. There's what we normally think about in terms of, you know, our, our cell phones, and that's, you know, cellular or not really so much cellular, but, but uh, you know, low speed relatively speaking, uh, wireless data. Uh, there's uh, high-speed inter, uh, sort of backbone wireless data services. That's the sort of stuff that runs on the top of the skyscrapers in uh, downtown Manhattan connecting, uh, you know, big, big banks to their sister sites over in New Jersey uh, for backup uh, internet service. Uh, and then there's the stuff that I do, which is consumer-grade uh, consumer grade Wi-Fi uh, or, or really just Wi-Fi in general which is fundamentally different in its nature than than these other types of Wi-Fi or these other types of networks it's neither super high speed you know gigabits per second but it's also not uh, centrally managed and run by a, by a uh, service provider um, NYC wireless is a nonprofit organization that's based in New York and uh, we started a bit over 10 years ago and really invented this whole idea of public space Wi-Fi. Uh, if you've ever used Wi-Fi in New York City, it, when you go into a park, for example, Bryant Park, which was probably the most, still the most popular Wi-Fi park in the city, uh, that's a project that we built, uh, that we built uh, in, in uh, 2002 and 2003. Uh, we've got a lot of parks around New York City that has, have Wi-Fi. There's some, there's some other folks that have built these types of uh, projects as well, but we are the only nonprofit that operates in New York that still builds this stuff out. Um, we also were one of the first, uh, or one of the creators of this idea of community wireless, and that's really what I would ideally want you guys to take away, which is that uh, wireless broadband is not something that requires billions of dollars of investment, uh, or not necessarily something that requires billions of dollars of investment and very large uh, centrally managed service providers. It's something that you and I can all do collaboratively from the ground up, uh, and it's something that you can that that we can actually build out uh, and provide service to each other uh, and provide service to our community using off-the-shelf hardware. Thanks. I'll, I'll introduce Sandeep Biotra now for, from Morgan Joseph. Um, hi, I'm um, Sandeep Biotra, managing director at Morgan Joseph. Uh, Morgan Joseph is a middle market investment bank, and um, what that means is we provide uh, financing as well as uh, M&A advisory services to the middle market. Uh, we just four blocks down on, in the Rock Center building. My role is uh, I focus in the telecom area. Um, I've done a number of wireless deals. Uh, the most uh, notable being when Clearwire was, I guess, the name we're all familiar with is that the, the main asset is the spectrum that they have, and I represented the ITFS Alliance when they did the sale uh, to Clearwire, 
and we also raised uh, money for a company called TowerStream, uh, which is a Vimax based uh, um, ISP in the city and in 10 different markets in the country. Um, before uh, doing banking, I had a, a real job as, as a, as a <laughs> wireless engineer. So I grew up as a wireless engineer and um, I worked with a company called Hughes Network Systems. And it's actually fascinating for me. I, when I started off my uh, career, I worked in the wireless and local loop, which is basically a, a, a solution for developing countries not to dig up trenches but have basic telephony. Um, and that's clearly morphed into Vimax and broadband and you know and we have uh, different business models evolving so it's an industry which um, holds a special place in my, in my heart just uh, you know in addition to being uh, a banker so um, it's something uh, which is I'm very excited about. Thanks very much. It's really interesting that we have one bottom-up guy here uh, who doesn't need much investment and then we have Light Squared which is top-down they're distributing everything from satellites and uh, they need billions of dollars. Uh, I think <coughs> before we go any further, I, I'd like to ask the panelists' opinions, and uh, people in the audience are welcome to join in. Uh, just what is broadband, and what is broadband wireless? You know, the FCC said that what half the country or most of the country will have broadband, and how is what does that mean? And then how is that related to broadband wireless? So uh, who would like to, which of the panelists would like to uh, tell us? Okay, Bart, thanks. <laughs> so my, my personal view is that broadband is an oxymoron because mm -hmm. bandwidth refers to an analog spectrum and everything we're talking about here is digital to start with. But even ignoring that, the, the basic drivers that we're talking about here are ease of use. You want to be able to get content whenever you want it in whatever form, voice data, video, that you want it. You want to be able to store it. You want to be able to look at uh, movies. You want to be able to do all of these different things. And so under this umbrella of, and, and no wires, <laughs> no wires in this. So uh, in fact, broadband wireless is, is quite ubiquitous because we have tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of Linksys and D-Link routers out there. Uh, that uh, permeate everything and all that will happen is that they'll it's kind of like kudzu they'll come up from the bottom and you'll just start to see them spread their tentacles going elsewhere uh, so mm -hmm. glad to get other people to sound off Anyone else? yeah I'll just give you a, uh, a technical view of that because you'll hear this uh, very often uh, broadband as per ITU the governing body in telecom uh, is 1.5 and 2 megabits per second uh, primary ISDN, higher rates than primary ISDN. But I think uh, the question, equally the question is, is the current definition of broadband relevant in the future? Because if you look at broadband, I think it's really broad. <coughs> if you look at today, it starts from 1.5 megabits per second uh, as per IT, uh, ITU, uh, ITU. But it can go right up to 1 gig, we are talking in, in about 10, 10, 10 years time frame. So it's Broadband is really, is really, really broad. <laughs> and uh, what, what's Light Square's view of this? Because you're providing much broader bandwidth with, with your LTE. But probably I would go for a user or usage-based definition. Broadband today primarily is being able to use what you can find on the internet from anywhere on any device. And on the internet, there is a lot of video, a lot of video streaming. So the underlying uh, technology has to be good enough to provide good quality video. Uh, that's today. Uh, tomorrow it will be HD video, 3D graphics. So it will continue and, and increase. But for today, I would say streaming video over the internet is probably the good uh, benchmark uh, to assess whether you've got a wireless broadband connection or not. But it's a moving target? It's think? a moving target. And what, what do you think of what these guys are saying, that, that we, 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 we already have broadband everywhere, is what Bart Stuck said, and, and Dana Spiegel said we don't need much investment to get there, we could just build it from the bottom up. Uh, so where does Light Square fit into this? So I, I, I think I, I would uh, support the analysis of the FCC in their national broadband plan, uh, saying that in the face of uh, probably a 50-fold increase 
in mobile data usage in the next five years, there isn't enough spectrum uh, in the US to satisfy that demand uh, with um, cellular uh, technology. And as light squared, uh, we have a spectrum that was satellite-based uh, spectrum originally that has been authorized for terrestrial usage eight years ago through successive uh, authorization. And we, we are the only source of new spectrum available today to provide additional capacity on the market. Uh, if you look at what's happening on the U.S. market today, only two 4G LTE networks have been announced and are being rolled out, Verizon and AT&T. None of the other wireless operators have enough uh, spectrum to roll out uh, a 4G LTE network in the country. So what we intend to do is to be the third 4G LTE infrastructure and to sell our capacity to the existing wireless carriers who haven't got 4G spectrum or haven't got it nationwide or haven't got uh, it in enough quantity. Uh, let, let me give you one, uh, one example. Uh, till now it has been very difficult for rural operators to offer competitive service because they could deploy a network on their particular rural territory but were not able to give their customers the nationwide roaming coverage because it was prohibitive from a price point of view. So what we did, for instance, recently with Cellular South is to enter into a reciprocal roaming arrangement for 4G traffic. We would pay them for roaming on their network what they would pay us. Uh, and that number would be a single digit dollar per gigabyte. So an order of magnitude lower from what you can pay on the market today. Uh, you don't find uh, a gigabyte lower than $40 uh, today. So single digit dollar, it's really an order of magnitude of difference. So all of a sudden, we are allowing a rural operator in a rural territory to be competitive. They will be deploying LTE themselves on a particular footprint, but they will be offering nationwide coverage to their customers thanks to the agreement with us. And we are uh, in the process of announcing half a dozen of similar agreements with other rural partners. It seems that, that big investments are needed for cellular parts, sir. Uh, I, I just want to pick up on some of the points that were raised because they're excellent points. Um, for example, we call this wireless technology cellular. What that means is that you have a limited amount of spectrum and you use it in a cell in a, in a confined geographic area. And as you leave that, you go to a new cell and you can use other frequencies that are hopefully there. And then finally, two cells away, you can use the spectrum that you were using in the first cell. So with a scenario with $10,000 base stations, you take a city like New York, you would view this as an urban canyon. <laughs> so every block would be a base station and would cover 40 subscribers hanging up there. And you just kind of ping pong down, reusing the spectrum throughout all of New York City. On the rural side, one of the problems with base stations in rural areas is that there's nobody there. <laughs> there's nobody there. There's no money to be made. So why would I want to spring for, you know, a very nice, you know, a, a cement pedestal, a nice enclosed vault, nice tower, you know, box of electronics, you know, $500,000 chunk of change. Uh, but if it's a $10,000 chunk of change, then we have a different discussion <laughs> where we're trying to offer these things in those areas because then there might actually be someone who would want to go look at Netflix at 8 o'clock at night. I, I think that's, that's a really good point and I was actually going to going to uh, extend your, your argument, Bart. Uh, you know, the, you, does anyone know what, who the largest IS, wireless ISP is in the world? No? Linksys. So you walk around and <coughs> everywhere you go there's Linksys access points that have the name Linksys there and you know, they, they've got the largest distribution of, uh, of wireless uh, broadcast uh, in the world. Um, and I think that that's a really, that, that really sort of takes this to, you know, it's, it's almost logical conclusion, which is that, you know, if, the, if you're looking at traditional, you know, cellular deployments or, or you know, <coughs> newer, which are not quite technically cellular, um, uh, you know, LTE type deployments and whatnot, you know, they have very large area coverage and they have very constrained spectrum usage, usage and, and 
the, the limitations of spectrum that we have today are not technological limitations. It's not that that wireless spectrum is somehow limited <coughs> in the way that, may, say, AT&T might talk about having not enough spectrum. You need to look at the one level deeper of that, which is that it's limited if you consider the way that a centralized ISP like AT&T or Verizon, using the technology that they're using uh, and, the, and the physical infrastructure that they're using, is able to make use of that spectrum. In that case, yes, they, they, they do have a, only a certain amount that they can make use of the spectrum that they have bought from the government and other, and other ISPs. But just like the $10,000 uh, base station that, that Bart was talking about where you can run them every block, well, with what, and you can actually make use of much denser uh, networks of broadcasters uh, and cover much, much more efficiently using the existing spectrum, uh, you can do the same, you know, just sort of dividing it up even more. It's the same way that integration works. You, know, you keep slicing thinner and thinner pieces and all of a sudden everything just sort of comes together. And so Wi-Fi as a technology for local di distribution is an, is an excellent uh, example of that where you have, I was in Dumbo the other day, there were, uh, on, I was sitting, standing on one, one block, one street corner, over 700 broadcasters of Wi-Fi, 700 different access points that were online and visible <coughs> as you walk down one city block. And if you think about that, you know, you, you look at cellular, where, which might have, uh, you know, one for a dozen or two dozen square city blocks versus the $10,000 access uh, router, which has, uh, which has one per city block, to Wi-Fi, which has 700 per city block, all of us, all using the, the, the tiniest, tiniest sliver of spectrum, uh, you sort of get this, a, a much more colorful sense of what it really means to be quote unquote spectrum limited, or, or maybe what it means to not actually technically be spectrum limited. Um, the, the one, getting back to your original question, I think the one part that no one ever talks about very explicitly about what broadband is, is that it's as much up as it is down. Uh, you know, we, we talk about consumption, but as the iPad has shown, there's as much, there's as much creation as there is consumption. Uh, you know, I could take my iPhone and uh, walk down the street and using a few different applications, broadcast video over the network when AT&T's network's working sufficiently. Uh, <laughs> broadcast video out to the, out to the entire world. Uh, and so for me, broadband is not just Consumption, spe consumption bandwidth, but also production bandwidth. And, and so it doesn't make sense for me to define broadband as, say, you know, one and a half gig uh, megabits to a gigabit, gigabit uh, downstream. It's got to have equal upstream capacity as well. Yes? So when you have a wireless <coughs> access point like the Linksys device, uh, it, it has a name associated with it that your Wi-Fi computer will see. So when you try to connect to a network, you'll see a bunch of different names. Uh, you know, it used to be the case that NYC Wireless would talk about how New York City would encounter spectrum issues earlier than anywhere else in the world just because of the density of population that we have. And so the 700 number is, which was just an example, it's not actually that unusual. Um, means that my laptop was able to see 700 personal <coughs> access points from one on one city block, walking down one city block. It was able to see 700 different uh, end users that set up a an access point that was broadcasting out Wi-Fi signal. Now they weren't all able to. I wasn't able to use all of them because most of them were locked down. But the fact that there were 700 of them. 700 unique ones out there was, I thought, particularly interesting. Let me ask you or Bart, is it, is it there some tragedy of the commons here? You, you know, you make this available to everyone, this, this little sliver of uh, spectrum, uh, two gigahertz spectrum, and 700 people want to use it at once to send all these videos. You know, they're all uh, watching a, whatever it is. They're all watching the same thing, which we see in New York all the time. Everyone's holding up a cell phone camera 
And now you're saying, well, they're not going to just take pictures, because I was at a rock concert the other day in my neighborhood, and, you know, there were, you know, several hundred people around, and instead of waving with the music, they were holding up their, their cameras. So now, Dana said they're all going to be sending videos using Wi-Fi, using the same spectrum. Is that going to work? Well, not the way that we have it today. Uh, I don't know if you want to, if you have a, a the, comment on this part. Yeah, the, um, the, uh, there, there's a, those of you that actually remember tuning your TV with tuner, <laughs> channel 14 to 51, uh, 400 and 500 megahertz bands, uh, so-called low power television. And those, those are very good for penetrating into rooms like this and doing a lot of interesting wireless things. And uh, we'll have to go see what our, our government, the FCC, decides how they want to uh, you know, do something with this. And that's, there, there, there's a lot of spectrum available. And, it, and Dave raises a good point that it's, uh, uh, if it's free, and you know the, the, the other problem that people don't talk about with the 2.4 gigahertz band is that's exactly where your microwave oven is. So you, know, you want to really have distortion, you're all set. Yeah, yeah. yeah a couple of points. Uh, you know, uh, when you talk about spectrum, you know, uh, deficiency. Uh, I mean, we're really talking, uh, you know, like networks like LTE in, in that space. Uh, you know, if you look at uh, today. Uh, the total spectrum which has been allocated to telecom in U.S. is about 550 uh, megahertz. And the calculations are that in in next five to ten years, it would be as much as 500 to 800 more. So uh, I, I, I appreciate your point, uh, Dina, on that. But right now, Wi-Fi, the way Wi-Fi is used, is it is an offload mechanism mostly. <coughs> So you, you have you have when 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 the the main networks on AT and T and Verizon get congested, you know uh, a lot of the, the usage of Wi-Fi is well it gets offloaded onto Wi-Fi. Now it remains to be seen whether or not Wi-Fi can be the primary technology. I think it's it's too prim premature to say that, but I think uh, right now the direction we are going in, we d definitely have a spectrum problem the way we are going. Yes. Actually. I'd like the panel to address two issues regarding to the future of the broadband uh, directions. One is on that, uh, is this a pure market play? For example, is there some regulatory requirement, you know, the certain areas you have to provide, you know, the uh, access for that uh, technology? Uh, the second question is that in the broadband wireless, are there players who has critical technology monopoly on certain kind of critical things which is only uh, for those uh, patent holders can uh, play uh, with uh, uh, competitive advantage. I can address the first one. Uh, when we got our authorization in March 2010 to deploy a 4G LTE network using the L-band, this satellite spectrum I was referring to, it came with build-out obligations. So we've got to cover 100 million pops by the end of 2012, 145 by the end of 2013, and 260 by the end of 2015. So 90% uh, uh, of the population will have to be covered by our network. We will go beyond that uh, ourselves, and we will also license our spectrum <coughs> to rural operators uh, who are interested in building out in, uh, in rural territories. But we've got those build-out obligations in our license. Your second question was about monopoly on the IP or...? Um uh, yes, I mean, that there is there any critical technology, like a choking point, but uh, which patent is owned by... Right, certain that's, a, that's so a very... So else can really... Well, I think... Uh, enter. It's semi-open but actually closed. Uh, I think, and if I get the drift, I guess in case of CDMA, for example, we all know Qualcomm is the big gorilla, 
and you, everybody has to pay a pound of flesh to Qualcomm and there are lawsuits back and forth, Nokia, Qualcomm, Samsung, it's like business as usual. And the good thing about the 4G technology is LTE, for example, it's very egalitarian, the whole approach, and they're still trying to figure out how the patent portfolio pooling is going to work. But from what I heard, that it's actually very egalitarian in terms of Qualcomm probably owns 11%, ZTE owns 9%, 10%, Samsung owns 10%, which is always, clearly Qualcomm <coughs> will not, may not agree to that, but that's kind of more healthy for the ecosystem when uh, one party doesn't kind of hold you hostage. So that hopefully would lead to a better device ecosystem, which we all know is critical for any broadband uh, to kind of take shape. So hopefully, if LTE is where the world is going, and that's what it looks like, the, the, the patent situation there is way more demo, uh, democratic rather than the way it was at the CDMA level. Let me, let me pick up on this. The, the one thing we haven't talked about is the display technology. So people have these iPads and their phones that they can stream video t with and so forth. So what you'll see in the next five years is a whole new generation of displays that will be far more power efficient and far more uh, brilliant in their uh, HD television resolution. And, and also what complements it is a low end, kind of a Kindle e-ink type of thing, more of a, you know, we, we haven't talked about the rest of the world, but there are the bulk of the phones are not sold in New York City. So there, there, there's a lot of other interesting displays that are very, that are MEMS based, that are very uh, cost effective and uh, things like liquid crystal displays and OLEDs, you'll, you'll see dropping in popularity and, and it's because people want to look at things, want to see pictures. There are a question on the pricing front. So we as a user, like a normal consumer, now would have to pay, like if I have an iPad, internet home, you know, on the phone, so like, you know, usually the normal pricing model is, you know, <coughs> you pay for the three devices. Any devices you get, you know, more. Tethering, more. So do you see that changing? Yes, definitely we see that changing. First of all, today, 70% uh, of the revenues of the industry are coming from mobile voice. Uh, but voice will represent only a fraction of the usage of mobile network moving forward. So there has to be a really a paradigm shift in the pricing from voice to data. Uh, the second thing is you, you don't know how much you are spending for data. If you've got an iPad or an iPhone, how much data have you consumed last month, the month before, you don't know. So as a consumer, you don't want to be locked into a monthly subscription because you lose if you don't spend your full allowance and you lose if you spend more. So uh, the, the model we, uh, we are discussing with a number of our customers is a model that is uh, much simpler, where you would buy a tablet, it will come with, let's say, 10 gigabytes of data included in the price of the hardware. Those 10 gigabytes will have unlimited validity, so you can use them in a week, in a month, in a year, doesn't matter. And once you've used them, you just top up, you buy another 10, another 20. And, you, and we've got some of our customers, wholesale <laughs> partners, thinking of allowing you to top up for multiple devices. So you've got a smartphone, you've got a tablet, maybe you've got a partner with another device, you can buy 50 gigabytes in bulk and you will tap into your bucket from the different devices. So yes, we expect considerable change and you will do it for data only. Voice will be just another application you run on your data uh, allowance. But I, but I think in terms of this, the cellular industry, uh, they have a long way to go to get to some profitable situation because uh, by my calculation, they're, they're collecting, I think, about $1,000 per gigabyte for voice, right? And then if you have an iPhone or something like that, what do you get, five gigabytes for $30 or $40? I mean, they're collecting your single digit or uh, yes, but data, <coughs> and the voice is finite, or going down, in fact. It, it, uh, it's uh, very and interesting. And the data is going up very, very fast. Yes. So will be pe pe people be willing to pay what it's costing the phone companies now <coughs> to uh, to deliver those gigabytes? Uh, Jarkit, yes. Yes. Yeah. In that industry. I think that this is a this is a key problem for the industry right now because there are two opposing forcing forces which are trying to you know manage the situation one is you want the broadband to be affordable to the people 
but on the other hand you have the data rates growing so rapidly and the capex to support the data rates is the CAGR is like 50 60 percent per year so uh, uh, as uh, as Frank mentioned your traditional sources of revenue are dropping why is it just becoming a, a, a just an application and it's going to drop in revenue but are the service providers able to get in future revenues from data uh, if we have you know conditions like uh, you know net neutrality and uh, you know, equal opportunity for broadband affordability, it puts a constraint and pressure on the service provider side to, uh, you know, to, to manage those capex levels. A couple of additional uh, comments. F first of all, uh, mobile operators are highly profitable companies, and especially if you contrast the U.S. situation uh, with uh, other developed markets, the top two players in the U.S are enjoying EBITDA margins that are 10, 15 points higher than their counterparts in other countries. So there is room to maneuver in terms of lowering uh, the price umbrella. Uh, so th that's the, the first consideration. Second consideration, we, we've been able to raise uh, $2 billion in the last year on a business plan that assumes that we will sell on a wholesale basis at a single digit dollar per gigabyte. And the business plan seem seems attractive to, to our investors. Why, why is that? Because when you look at the entire value chain and at what the mobile operator does today, half of the cash that is spent goes into the network, only half of it. The other half goes into handset subsidies, advertising, retail stores, call centers, billing systems. That second half can be done much more effectively by new players than by wireless operators. So let, let me uh, give you a couple of examples. Who is the best uh, retailer of uh, computing devices? Best Buy or Verizon? Who is the best online retailer? Amazon or AT&T? Couldn't Dell sell like they do in Japan, connectivity with their laptop when you purchase laptops online? If you have those players embedding wireless services into their offering, you eliminate that second half of the cash spent today by wireless operator, and you create room for the transition from the voice price-led uh, industry we've got today uh, to a data price-led uh, industry. But obviously, that transition will be painful for incumbents. I think I think that's a really a really good point. That you know, it, it actually surprises me that they spend as much as 50 percent of their of their capex on on the build out of their networks, but remember that AT and T and Verizon price their minutes or price their services by what the market bears, not what it costs them to provide. If you take a look at at the the, the scaling date, the scaling cost of data, yeah, a gig, you know, five gigabytes of data costs AT and T or Verizon thirty dollars because that's what you pay for the service on your phone. And then, uh, you know, as, as you were saying, David, uh, voice, you know, a gigabyte er, ver, ver, worth of voice minutes costs $1,000. Well, an SMS costs in the tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars for that amount of bandwidth. So what we're really seeing here is absolutely nothing about the actual cost of providing data, which, at which uh, based on Light, light uh, Squared's uh, business model is, in the sig single digits, and it's probably going to go down by, by orders of magnitude over the next decade or two from that. There, there's, there is, you know, the, the cost of a bit of data is, is effectively zero. The cost of delivery of that bit of data is effectively zero. There's some, there's some fixed cost infrastructure that needs to be built out, and that's non-zero, but that's, but that's amortized over the lifetime of that, of that uh, equipment. And then there is some some repair and maintenance that that is non-zero cost, but that's fractional compared to anything else. And so, what AT&T and Verizon and these huge telco companies have effectively done is turn themselves into marketing and sales machines. They don't own their networks. They don't they don't really uh, they don't manage their their own networks. A lot of that's outsourced uh, or contracted. They don't uh, they don't build their phones. All of that's outsourced. All they do is market and bill. And so a lot, of, a lot of the costs that you see that, that, that they're complaining about now are what any business would, would complain about when they're squeezed at 
uh, squeezed on their profits. And it's not, it's painful, but it's not like it's going to cause them to go out of business, or if it does, it's not like others won't be able to come in and take their place. Does anyone want to take up on this point? Uh, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's relevant to my uh, heart. I, I'm the founder of Arbinet, so I've seen uh, everything goes from uh, $8 a minute to call India to basically all you can eat not right now. You can buy unlimited India right now for $29 a month. Um, and so what we're seeing, all of you are talking about uh, data going back to per megabit billing, um, which is, a, again, a, uh, the opposite of where we are today. So uh, if you want to elaborate on that. What I've described is the way we will price the capacity of our network as a wholesale only business. I'm, I'm not prejudging on how, for instance, Best Buy, who is one of our customers, uh, or device manufacturers buying from us, will um, themselves uh, price those services. L let me pick one example. Uh, we are in advanced discussion with a consumer electronics company who want to buy capacity from our network to embed that capacity into consumer electronics devices that will come with a service. One example is a digital camera. You will buy a digital camera from them together with a storage service that you will pay, say, $8 a month. And uh, that will give you the ability to take a picture and then without worrying about it, it will be uploaded to the cloud in Picasa, Flickr, your personal locker, meaning you don't need to come back home uh, to tether it to your uh, PC or to use a memory card uh, or Bluetooth or whatever. There, the model, the pricing model will be very simple. <coughs> As a consumer, you pay $8 a month for a storage service uh, that comes together with your camera. Uh, another example would be a portable game console. You subscribe to a game, you want to be able to play that game on the go, it's an additional uh, $5 subscription. You want to play World of Warcraft on the go, there is a premium to the subscription, so you don't pay per, per gigabyte. So what we are allowing our customers to do is to develop whatever pricing they want. Uh, if you look at the wholesale business uh, today, which is v very limited in size in the US, it's a retail minus construct in all the commercial arrangements. So uh, the existing uh, wireless carriers would allow uh, their wholesale customers to sell at their own retail price minus a discount. Our model is completely different. We charge on a cost plus basis and then we leave complete freedom to our customers in terms of uh, pricing schemes they want to introduce. Uh, Dr. Tour, do you want to comment on some of these? Uh, a couple of points. Yeah, I mean, a couple of points I want to state, state the, you know, one that AT&T and Verizon, these service providers also have to maintain their legacy networks. That means they have 2G networks, three, they, ha they, have, they have federal, you know, uh, obligations to maintain those networks. So they have 2G network, 3G network, 4G network. So they're, they're maintaining these huge networks in parallel. A bulk of their cost is OPEX. And, you know, uh, so, so there are huge costs absolutely associated with running and maintaining those networks because of uh, the way the obligations are, are, are structured right now, that you can't retire old networks as fast as you want. Uh, the second part of it is, you know, uh, I also believe technologically speaking, uh, and maybe David, you, you can provide some insight into it, I think uh, your revenues are, are, are staying pretty much the same. You're not rising much in the revenue, you're actually going to drop. But you have to put new infrastructure still. <coughs> so to get to, to get to 4G, we have to put m thousands and thousands of new base stations, uh, you know, or upgrade the old ones to, to get to that point. So, so that CapEx is still part of the equation. We haven't spoken about the cost of spectrum. I mean, that is an enormous cost up front that, uh, I mean, other players don't, I mean, if, if you're looking at Wi-Fi, doesn't pay for, but operators do pay for that, yeah. uh, which is not unlimited in the sense that it's not forever. There is a time period for which they use that spectrum. For example, uh, in India, they spent about $15 billion for 5 megahertz of spectrum. 
and that's only for 15 years. So, uh, you know, the, the, this sort of stuff keeps on adding up. So it's not just as simple uh, as, as putting up the hardware and it's there for life. So. I guess a lot of you know that uh, AT&T and Verizon mainly, but the U.S. industry just spent $19 billion on the 700 megahertz spectrum. Something else I saw looking at CTIA webpage, which has a lot of data, spreadsheets on the cellular industry, and they just track from 1985 or 86 onward uh, how many base stations there are in the United States. I forgot how many, but it's quite a lot more than there is. Uh, and then they say the capital investment in the cellular industry, and it's a million dollars base station. Now, where the costs are going, maybe they're shifting from the electronics to other costs. The backhaul is becoming extremely expensive for things like LTE, uh, other things than that. So, so just to uh, reinforce your point that it's an expensive business, uh, looking at it one way, as you say, they're more than compensating for it with their revenues so far, but maybe their current business plan isn't going to last. Just on that, let's, let's look at the numbers. <coughs> Typically, uh, a mobile operator spends 10 to 12 percent of its revenue in capex, and uh, if I take the US example, uh, generate 40 percent of EBITDA margin. So th the situation is very far from uh, a bankruptcy situation. <laughs> it, it's a highly profitable business that generates a lot of free cash flow after having invested in the future network. So th there is room to manage the transition I was talking about from voice to data. The uh, general part of my question was to ask you about the uh, uh, the demand for backhaul and middle haul and uh, what is going to be needed in terms of infrastructure um, and technologies uh, to, ha uh, to handle backhaul, uh, the backhaul part of it. And th th I guess the specific part of my question is uh, assuming that the need for backhaul is great, let's assume that it, the answer is yes, uh, what are the prospects for um, backhaul via uh, low latency, uh, lower latency uh, satellite in say lower medium earth orbit? Well, backhaul clearly is a choke point, especially where we're sitting right now. It's um, not so much the last mile spectrum, it is a choke point at the base station, which is the backhaul problem. And, and one very illuminating fact is that only 10% of the cell sites in this country have fiber to the tower. And we, we are sitting at a wireless conference, but we all know when we have to carry gigabits of traffic from a cell site, fiber is the most optimal solution, but it's only available in 10% of the, the places. Clearly, there are other uh, ways to do it, which is microwave and Ethernet over copper, uh, which kind of alleviates the problem. But as our smartphones become smarter, um, and one very telling statistic is that when Clearwire switched on in Baltimore, the network, the average smartphone user were using 10 times the bandwidth compared to a regular cell phone user. And all this the traffic has to be carried through, so backhaul is a huge bottleneck. And, uh, you know, the solutions there is a combination of fiber and kind of more <coughs> microwave techniques. I can comment on our network uh, design. The, the vast majority of our cell sites will have a fiber backhaul and will have a minority using microwave link. But in, in dense urban and urban areas, we will have fiber backhaul uh, to cope with the, uh, the usage we expect. What? Dana, what are you assuming with all these millions of link systems, how, how the uh, information is getting into and out of uh, core network? Well, that's actually a huge problem for us, even in New York. So a lot of people assume that New York City is the most wired place in, in the country. But, and, and while it is true in some measures, it's absolutely not true for end users. Uh, and you know, we have huge amounts of fiber, you know, fiber running under the roads in, in uh, New York City, but you can't. We effectively operate as an end user subscriber to a lot of, to a few different ISPs, and we don't have access to fiber, for example, except through FiOS. Uh, and and so for, I think that at least for community <coughs> community uses, there's actually a, a huge need for alternative uh, connect, connection options, uh, ones that don't require 
a huge upfront cost. I, I think that uh, we're doing some research to, for you to be able to get access to fiber in Manhattan uh, through Empire Telecom, which is a Verizon subsidiary that run, that manages the fiber to fiber uh, laying fiber in New York in Manhattan. I don't know if they do the other boroughs, but they definitely do Manhattan. Uh, you, you requires a two hundred thousand dollar deposit just to op just to start the discussion about opening up the streets, and I forget what the price point per mile is, but it's a, but it's pretty equivalent, and so the cost of even you know building out your own network like that is is prohibitively expensive, or even just getting access to networks like that is prohibitively expensive for any sort of uh, anything else other than a, a sort of top down well funded uh, player in the in the market. Uh, we have problems because we actually have deployments in parks and public spaces where there is no broadband available. Uh, there's there's barely DSL. There's no cable <coughs> system. FiOS doesn't exist and won't ever exist. Uh, and mostly it's just because we aren't a plate. You know, we, we're running our networks in places that are not uh, are not registered as. Uh, residences or, or official businesses that, such that they requ that regulations require Verizon to provide service. Um, we've done some Wi-Fi, uh, sorry, some some cellular backhaul, which is terrible uh, in terms of speed and latency. And we've done a little bit of WiMAX uh, and pre-WiMAX uh, backhaul through uh, through Tower Stream. Uh, and uh, through through Rainbow uh, networks, and and those are great, but they're expensive too. You know, the costs are three to three to ten x what a traditional uh, business uh, wireline would cost. Uh, so I think that there's a huge opportunity for all sorts of new types of, of backhaul to be made available, and you know, we're just hoping someone else is going to take up the charge on the backhaul side. Thank you. Do you see an opportunity here for some? technical breakthrough in the backhaul. I mean, we've seen people uh, enhancing radio systems, pushing more and more bits through the air, but it seems that we're, <coughs> as you say, and Dana, the, the bottleneck now is someplace else. Uh, will technology help? Well, it has been helping, short of fiber, which really is the, the holy grail, um, but again, it only makes sense for at this point for dense urban areas. The, the microwave technology has moved up quite a bit in terms of having fight, uh, kind of fat, uh, big microwave pipes at these sites. And there are things like Ethernet over uh, copper. You know, there are a bunch of companies which basically they bond, bonded, bonded Ethernet. So you join four or five twisted pairs and create a bigger pipe out of it, which could be a D1 or a DS1. So those kind of technologies are definitely there uh, to ameliorate the pain. But that clearly is a huge choke point, and uh, you know, short of fiber being everywhere, the wireless technologies will have to step up, I mean, as they have in the past. The uh, <coughs> EBITDA margins of uh, service providers uh, was, were mentioned by Frank. Uh, uh, one reason for these high margins, a small reason maybe, is that uh, uh, the service providers in the US charge for all incoming international calls the same long distance rate as they charge for any outgoing calls. And that's the only country I know. It's very frustrating for people who travel overseas quite a bit and still use their GSM phones. So uh, is there, uh, what's the reason? Is there any backlash? Is, is there anything to, to change that in the future? Uh, are you aware of this, first of all? I mean, th there is a technology, I mean, regulatory uh, offering called special access which when you, if you remember back when AOL was cranking up, you got these disks and they had put the disk in and then you'd pick a local phone number and you'd call that local phone number and then you'd be on the internet. So special access is now in at least 60 countries and what you'll see happen is it'll be two cents per minute of use to go do your, the calls you're talking about because they'll, it won't be the three dollars or four dollars per minute of use that you're talking about that go over the internet. But, but that's not my question. So if, if you, you said what was going to change. Uh, if you're talking about in international roaming, I it's not regulated. Uh, I, I was running international roaming for Vodafone, who is the largest player in, in that field. The only part in the world where it's regulated, it's Europe. Because the EU wants to eliminate roaming across member states in Europe. 
so that you can have your subscription in the UK, you travel to Germany, you make a call back to the UK <coughs> or in Germany, and you pay domestic price. So the EU is uh, establishing caps that are reduced year after year to eliminate international roaming altogether. But when you are in the US or in any other country for that matter, and you are a carrier, you try and maximize your international roaming revenues. So you look at it country by country, and you look at the balance of traffic. If you are receiving more traffic than you are sending to that country, you try and extract a higher price. And that's a very profitable <coughs> business uh, in, uh, in the US and in other countries. I mean, it's, it's the, if, even if you look domestically, that's how the rural carriers make their money. Because when all of us kind of go through the middle of nowhere and we want signal, it's the rural carrier kind of fronting all the expense, and they charge a pretty penny for that. So even domestically, it's the same. Uh, so that will continue for the foreseeable future. No, it doesn't happen for, for overseas. For the, rural, for the rural carriers, as I indicated, we are changing that for the first time in the, in the country. We've signed our first agreement <laughs> with Cellular South, uh, Southern Illinois Wireless Open Range, to establish a reciprocal roaming arrangement. So it, we will uh, allow our customers to roam in those rural, uh, on those rural networks at a single uh, digit dollar per gigabyte, and themselves they will roam on our network at the same rate. Yes. To what degree, uh, I mean, we've talked about uh, a lot of the technological issues, some of the business issues. Um, I know that uh, a number of years ago, um, MPLS technology was supposed to uh, help, you know, create more um, bandwidth on, on, on all the telephone networks, I think. Uh, the rural um, uh, landline owners were, were inhibiting sort of the progress with that and, and sort of making that a, uh, not a, 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 a workable solution. Uh, but there's protocols and there's other ways that things, as far as we're, if we're talking about technology, I mean, there's various protocols that can evolve. How much, how much of the, a lot of these issues can be re resolved and bandwidth created with better reservation protocols, uh, even on the backhaul like MPLS, I don't, I think that's kind of an old technology now, but um, uh, ways of aggregating and creating prioritization uh, for, for different kinds of traffic. I, I can add one data point to, to this question, you know, where, where does the technology come in? And I, looking at the CTIA website uh, and, and looking at some data on just cellular, so they've increased their capacity by 10,000 over some period of time, or two decades, or something like this. And then I said, well, where does it come from? So I think a factor of three or four is spectrum. <coughs> the government's opened up new spectrum. Uh, another factor, huge factor, is just more base stations. And a factor of seven is the technology. And that's over two decades. And a lot of that comes from just <laughs> operating in wider and wider bandwidths. You know, GSM operates in 250, 200 kilohertz, and WCDMA is 5 megahertz, LTE is now up to 20. So that's, that's kind of easy increase. So, so even though my whole life is in technology, I'm not too optimistic. Judge, uh, yeah, where do you see that coming from? Yeah, just to add to that, that's a, that's a very pertinent point. You know, if you look at the way I see is that in the urban areas, you will see the disaggregation of the networks. They will become, you know, smaller and smaller cells, as Bart said, you know, reaching onto every nook and corner. But then you have issues of uh, uh, how do you get backhaul to them? You know, that that's a the more number of cells you have, the more complex the problem on the backhaul, wh whichever way you look at it. Then uh, on the rural side, I think the issue is more of the middle mile. So there may be possibility of aggregation. So you so you'll see like wireless going together. You have one point, and you have aggregation and infrastructure sharing. So I see uh, from my experience in deploying wireless networks, the biggest problem has always been real estate and backhaul. So uh, I and I don't see that going away even with smaller cell. Only the equation will change that you have more points, but more problems on backhauls. Yes. Uh, here. Yeah. Oh, okay, this guy. Sorry, he's been waiting with the microphone. <coughs> Is your opinion um, an advertising uh, business model doable and feasible for the operator 
where it's basically the advertiser paying for the access of the broadband plan and not the user, like we are used to with internet or with the TV over the air. Something doable in the future? Well, I'll, I'll feel the, you, you might have a, a feedback on the more cellular side, but I'll, feed, I'll, I'll provide some, some insight on the uh, Wi-Fi side, since that's where it's much more, uh, or has been tried much more. Uh, the short answer is it's not, not as anyone could ever imagine it. Uh, the, there have been ad-driven networks that have generated, uh, generated some level of revenue. Uh, there was a, I forget the name of it now, but there was a, a network out in uh, the Bay Area that was trying to build out uh, Muni Wi-Fi in, I think it was the San Jose area. Um, and so basically it was a private network that was going to charge, and then they switched over to uh, an advertising model and stopped billing, and from the need, fr from the ability to drop the billing system and the ability to generate revenue from advertising, their revenues increased by 10x, but they still went out of business very fast because it was no, it was no longer profitable. Uh, and it, it was never going to be profitable. And so what you've basically seen are a, a number of different efforts to build uh, Wi-Fi based networks ba built on advertising. Uh, and we've not seen a single one of them really succeed, not, not in any sustainable way. Uh, it could be part of a sustainable, uh, sorry, it's part of a sustainable business model, but I doubt you'll see Wi-Fi or similar types of networks be deployed driven solely based on uh, on an advertising model. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I mean, there's a basic fundamental difference between TV stations and uh, cell phones. One is, namely, it's two-way, one-way. The overheads of running a cell phone network are a lot more complicated and expensive, and hence it can't be supported uh, just on that <coughs> alone. And Muni Fi-Fi has been a dirty word for a long time because of those very reasons. Uh, it's appropriate place for me to chime in here. Um, my name's Adam Black. I uh, run a startup called Key Wi-Fi, and as Dana and some other people here know, we are very interested in uh, the other side of this argument, which hasn't been opened up here, which is uh, redistribution. Um, the reality is that this conversation is basic, from my ears anyway, is basically there's going to be lots more traffic, so we need lots more ways of delivering that traffic. And we're having a conversation here about how we're slicing up this cake because everybody's on mobiles and everybody's going to be watching TV on mobiles 24-7. <laughs> and what has happened is there is a, oh, we've got to provide the same broadband in a home or in an office to people on the move. And, uh, oh, therefore we need more and we need more investment and we need more charges. And chances are everybody in this room is most probably paying one way or another about four times for their broadband. They're paying at home, 40 bucks. They're paying for their mobile, another 30 bucks. Uh, they're paying as part of their work contribution, and who knows, maybe they've got uh, one, of, one of the cameras at $8, maybe their kid's got a, a PlayStation. So altogether, 150 bucks, right? The reality is that, like Dana said, just about everywhere you go, you will find a Wi-Fi connection. And that may be owned by somebody else. It may be a fiber. It may be through a $10,000 or $250,000 box. It may be through a satellite connection. Maybe through anything. The point is the networks themselves are not being run efficiently or managed efficiently. And everybody is, uh, lots of people are being overcharged <coughs> in multiple places to support fundamentally inefficient uh, methodologies. For example, 40 or 50 percent of the bandwidth <coughs> of data traffic on mobile phones could be going this second, this second, don't need any new technology, could be delivered through Wi-Fi. Because everybody with those mobile phones has Wi-Fi in their phone and is standing next to a Wi-Fi hotspot. The only thing that's missing is that they don't have the password to that hotspot. And by the way, everybody, that's what we're doing. We're <laughs> so, seriously, there is a question here. The question is, can the panel discuss for a little minute the opportunity of the redistribution as opposed to just more technology and different technology. Because I think there's a big elephant in the room, and it's called redistribution of service. Yes, but you're, you're absolutely right, and depending on, on the carrier, what you hear is that you've got uh, between 20 and 40 <coughs> percent of current cellular traffic that could be offloaded uh, to a Wi-Fi in one form or another. Uh, Having said that, 
it doesn't solve the other 60 to 80 percent, which in volume terms is going to grow 50 fold in the next five, six years. So the answer is yes and, uh, and no. I'll take the guess for the first three years. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just building on that, because that's a very important point from a network's perspective. Most of the broadband, you know, you see the traffic is coming from three areas, primarily from video. You know, video is the main culprit here. And then you have, uh, you know, the social networking and the games. If you see that uh, we, uh, the, the way the networks were designed earlier, in the, in the peak R and, you know, peak traffic zones, in fact, this problem is going to become much more complex now <coughs> because of video. Because the person who's using video, let's say, uh, in a stock exchange, and he goes back home, he takes that traffic away, and the spikes are going to be far bigger. So there is a trend in the industry towards what we call self-optimizing networks. So you will see that you know, uh, in, on the cellular side, there, you know, networks, there is a focus to bring more intelligence into the networks and dynamically adjust the networks. I think we still have some time to, to, to reach that point, but there is clear recognition of that fact. Yeah, you know, I, I think the redistribution in the near term is a good short term solution for the for some of the from for some of these issues. Um, but as as most people who talk to me on at, at conferences and whatnot are surprised to hear, the, the Wi Fi guy is the probably the loudest proponent of just stopping the discussion and just building out as much fiber distribution as we can get throughout the country. There is no other solution. Wireless is great. It's, it's going to be, in the near term, supplemental. Uh, and, and you'll be able to supplement it more and more. And it'll take, it'll, there's some types of wi wireless that will offload from other types of wireless and from, bro and from landline uh, congestion. But the truth of the matter is, and the thing that, the, that this country is inexplicably fearful of admitting is that the only long-term solution to bandwidth problems is to have a, an advanced fiber network permeating the entirety of the country. That doesn't mean that 100% <coughs> of every square foot is covered, but rather that in, in line with 95% uh, of the population density that we build fiber out to each individual homeowner and each individual residence. And with that in place, then we can talk about some real offloading that might happen and some real network optimization that might happen where Verizon actually may have a contract with a lot of other individual network operators or you know, community networks or whatever they are to have carriage of, you know, to use 10% of the landline carriage wherever they are to do Wi-Fi offloading. And, and now, all of a sudden, with, with, sufficient, with sufficient, for the future, bandwidth of fiber throughout this country, ne then all of a sudden we won't have the sort of issues that we're dealing with right now. But everything that's talked about in the industry as solutions is just patches on the, onto the problem. Does anyone know where the investment would come from for this fiber network? I, I've, seen, uh, I've seen numbers where, it's, where the entirety of the, the country could be covered for under $100 billion. So we, we just uh, um, raised funds for this company called Allied Fiber, which is exactly doing that. And it basically is doing the middle mile fiber, which is what I'm the conversation from Chicago to New York to Ashburn, Virginia, and Ashburn because it's a huge data center is there. And the whole rationale there is not only is it the latest grid of fiber, it's also the fiber which is built in the late 90s when we know there was a glut of fiber, uh, but not anymore was fiber which was kind of a, a highway which you can't access, there's no on-off ramp in the middle. And the way the Allied Fiber do it, is doing it every 50, 60 miles, you can tap into the fiber, which is extremely critical for all these backhaul bottleneck issues. So, but you're absolutely right uh, that the funding was one of the hardest we worked on just because it is very hard to make the case to investors in spite of what the current numbers look like because they gotten burned in the late 90s when there was a clutter fiber and everybody and their cousins had fiber under the ground. But thanks to video, it's not the case anymore. So you have a revenue, obviously there's a revenue model. For there is. So paying for all this. Exactly. So you have to pre-sell the, pre the fiber before you lay the fiber. So it's a wholesale model as well, the leasing dark fiber to all the carriers who actually need all this fiber. The food flies in the pudding. One of the, one of the interesting parts of that, is, as, as uh, just the, the tail end of that conversation, is that some of the most advanced uh, 
city deployments of fiber are community networks like the like St. Cloud and and Utopia in Utah, and uh, there's a, there's a network in uh, that that's been uh, run by Case Western Reserve <coughs> University and Lafayette uh, Lafayette County in in uh, Louisiana passed regulation that they're actually building out net, uh, their own they're self funding the fiber networks and unlike unlike some of the high high visibility failures of Muni Wi-Fi uh, these networks are actually built and run not just a, not just inexpensively and affordably but profitably as well uh, and and I think that it's not the entirety of the solution to the funding problem but it's a it's part of the solution to the funding problem which is to enable uh, localities to self-fund and to and to build out the, these local these local fiber networks and let them interconnect with each other, uh, and so you take as opposed to trying to fund the entirety of the thing all at once, you fund little pieces of it along the way, and everybody chips in as they go. You're waiting with the microphone. Hi, um, uh, I'm from the Internet Society. Yeah. The Allied Fiber, no, it's very interesting. What's very interesting about Allied Fiber is that the model that they're on is like it's just a real estate model. They build the fiber and anybody can get at it. They have open access. And I think that's a very interesting thing. I mean, it's as radical as if when the cable company put the cable into your house, you'd have a choice of who, what company you could connect to with it. And so um, I'm just getting sort of more, you know, uh, Dana just sort of kind of answered my question, which was going to be a little bit about <coughs> the role of of government in providing, you know, at the last mile. But following up on what he said earlier, I mean, about there being need for a backbone. I mean, at the moment we have a lot of toll roads, and is there a need for an Eisenhower kind of, you know, national plan to, to, to build freeways across across the country? Um, address. That was my question. Thanks. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. That's a very good analogy because if you look at the, the broadband, it's exactly like a road. And if you look at the applications which you run on it, they are like the vehicles which run on, the, on, that, uh, on that road. People very often remember which car went on that road, but they forget that, that what's enabling that is the road. And uh, you, the question is, how high is that toll? I think that's the fundamental question. If, you're gonna, if you have a toll route and you have to have, you know, obviously you can't have it free, uh, what, what level of toll you can put to build that. I will say, you know, the MTA charges on the bridges to maintain all the bits of, you know, the beams of the infrastructure. Just a comment on that. <coughs> it's happening in other countries in the world. There are countries where fiber penetration for the last mile is much more advanced. Uh, Japan, uh, South Korea, several European countries. Netherlands. Australia. 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 Cape Town, I think, has a rule but that anyone who digs up the street has to put in fiber. Yes, but and the government is <coughs> going to operate it. Yes, yeah, so there, there are t you, you usually uh, two, um, uh, two ways for that to happen. Either it's government mandated, or um, the regulation is such that it prevents duplication of investment so if you are the first one to connect a particular building, you need to unbundle to the other carriers. That's the system that has been implemented in several European countries. So either government mandated or regulated unbundling uh, is a good catalyst for investment to come. Otherwise, it, it, it won't, because it's very hard to justify uh, fiber investment in the last mile. Nobody seems to mention cable. Is this a essentially an industry that's going to die slowly or rapidly as it's replaced first by wireless and then by direct uh, optical cable? No, I would say on the contrary, on the wireline side, they are better positioned than AT&T or Verizon because they are extracting more revenues per household <coughs> because of their uh, TV services. So they are, they are the best positioned to make the investment in fiber, I would argue. Uh, it, it, there's another, uh, yeah, the, the, the other thing that people miss is that the cable systems are built out in the U.S. and they run a lot of fiber by houses, but they also run them by these base stations. So when you go by the base station, then you can go to the wireless carrier there, and there might be four carriers on the tower, and you sign up one of them, and they back all over the cable network. And they've started to do that. 
and that's happening all over the place, yeah. And who are the uh, best positioned cable companies for this? I would say Cox, only, Cox is <laughs> the most aggressive <laughs> in terms of, Cox Communication is kind of very aggressive in terms of um, their Ethernet services and so on and so forth. They do have, uh, I think that's what you were getting at, they had, do have a slight risk at this point of what they call over-the-top television, which is just not bypassing cable altogether, just having a broadband pipe coming to your home and watching internet TV through Hulu and other sites out there. But that's a different problem um, <coughs> infrastructure-wise. I agree with Frank, infrastructure-wise, they're better positioned um, in terms of having HFC all the way up and fiber to the node, if not to the home. So in what ways is is the US, is U.S. wireless broadband industry more advanced or not as advanced as some of the other countries? So for example, some people mentioned in South Korea, Japan. And what explains for the reasons why the U.S. is either more advanced or not as advanced? And what are some of the areas in which, in which this country um, is moving ahead of, of other countries or, is it, or, or, or in fact, is moving behind other countries. So, so I think you have a topic for the next enterprise forum. It's <laughs> 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 a huge question. Uh, okay, I'll take one. Uh, I'll I can take a two quick, answers. Yeah, two answers. Quick stab at it, and then we're going to wrap wireless, up. The, and this is strictly my my point of view. In the wireless, is, uh, we are not as advanced as the the rest of the world, or at least we were not till we go to 4G where we should catch up. Because we follow the free market principles, we let all the protocols come into the being, and because of that, there was not a unique s ecosystem which got developed, which it did in the rest of the world, but GSM was a chosen standard. So that, by the nature of free market, we got left behind a little bit because of that. In the wired infrastructure, US is very different from South Korea. You can wire Europe and South Korea because they're very, they're not as big countries. It's very hard to do that in, in the US, so there's a big, geographical disadvantage from that perspective that we can never have that kind of fiber penetration, for example. Uh, Judge, one last uh, answer to this question, and then we'll give everyone a chance to say what they want. Okay. So, no, I, I agree with you, uh, you know, Sandeep, that basically U.S. has taken, I think, for a chain, taken a head start on 4G. So, so uh, Verizon and AT&T are the first two big operators in the world to start LTE, and this is as Deep said, this is a scale business, I mean, a, an early adopter business. If you are early in the game, you can set the market direction uh, in a number of ways. You, the ecosystem starts developing around it, the, the, you know, the applications, the devices, and all those systems start converging. So for a change, earlier, I, I, yeah, I agree that uh, in Europe and Asia were ahead of us in terms of uh, 3G and 2G uh, wireless, but now for a change with, with higher smartphone penetration as well as LTE head start, we are, we are ahead of the game. I'll ask each panelist if they have one more uh, remark, one comment, one summary, and uh, I'll put up a question in case you haven't thought of what you want to say, and that is what are we going to say when we're here in uh, nine years, in 2020, about broadband wireless? Are we going to think it's hot stuff, or what, where is it going to take us uh, that we're not already that we don't already have? Uh, maybe I'll go in the order that we started. Frank, do you want to comment on? You don't have to answer my question. Anything you want <coughs> to uh, to uh, to wrap up? So just to wrap up, I'd like to uh, to rebound on the last remark to say, as the U.S. will be. Uh, among the largest countries, the first one to deploy 4G LTE, and that 4G LTE is the required infrastructure to deliver a great mobile internet experience. Uh, it's a unique opportunity for the U.S. to regain leadership in the wireless space. The, on the only missing link there is to have enough capacity. And so that's where, uh, as uh, the first wholesale provider, we expect to add capacity to the market and to allow many players to innovate and to use that capacity in the way they want. Uh, now to your question about uh, what can we expect or what will surprise us in the coming years, uh, I, I would uh, put on the table the fact that mobile voice over IP will happen much faster than we anticipate. Mark, you want to wrap up? Yeah, I'm just yeah. thinking <laughs> the uh, I'd like, I'd like to go back to the, the fiber example. For example, in 1990, I was pulled into South Korea, and they were trying to figure out how to take their network to be world class in the year 2000. 
Now, South Korea has rocks like nobody has rocks. So they're Seoul and four other cities that have 75% of the population. So he said it, it's pretty obvious what you do is you put fiber into these fiber rings into these cities and trunk them together and then the Chabal can hook up their PBXs and routers and they get off your back. And then you can have the fiber rings sprout tentacles to do cable TV service. There wasn't any. You'll have cellular towers. There wasn't any. I, su I suggested looking at CDMA to go do that. I, I said there'll be two-way data communication. There was no World Wide Web in 1990. This is 1990. And what we did for this was we did a P&L. The Koreans said, what do you mean, p and I said, yeah, there's things called customers. <laughs> they pay money. <laughs> you know, you're going to be deregulated and there'll be competition. You know, and they, and they listened and they went back and, and executed against this. Uh, you know, just, you know, get out of the way and let them go at it. And, but that's a unique set of circumstances there with, with their density. You know, you can't, uh, wire, wireless is very compelling uh, in lots of other parts of the world. The, the, the half the phones that are sold are these $20 GSM phones going into Kazakhstan and Chad and, you know, that, that's, that's not what we're talking about here. That's, that's, that's what they, they do and we'll see what, what happens. And that's where I would expect the interesting things to happen is in that emerging market area that is now really taking off. And uh, we'll, we'll see what they come up with. Do a lot with narrowband wireless. Objected to it. Yeah, I would just like to say that you know uh, broadband holds a, a lot of promise. Uh, you know, uh, in the society, in the economy. Uh, I'm very often asked the question, "What are you going to do with this all this bandwidth?" And it's the same question which I think <coughs> the, the computer folks were asked that when all the paying slips are transacted in 1960s or 70s, what what do you need this processing power for? So. Uh, I think we, we, we tend to overestimate the, the near future, uh, but underestimate the long-term benefits of broadband. It has immense potential, and uh, I see machine to machine, I see holographic projections, things like that coming in, and, but obviously they need the, <coughs> the supporting ecosystem to develop as well. So it will evolve over a period of time. Uh, the only point I would like to state is that to, for that to happen, you know, we have to keep in mind that there has to be sustainability of infrastructure as a business model. Whichever model we follow, LTE, Wi-Fi, or whatever, the sustainability of the business model is at the core of investment and innovation in this sector. Uh, well, I, I probably won't be on this panel in 10 years because Wi-Fi won't, be, uh, won't be deployed like it is today. Uh, I'm, you know, if you remember back 10 years ago, uh, in, in 2001, a Wi-Fi access point cost about 500 bucks, if not more, uh, and the, the <coughs> probably, uh, you know, probably the number of people that had access to Wi-Fi gear, for example, uh, was many orders of magnitude less than today. Uh, and so I think that we're going to see a lot of different types of wireless permeating, and my, it's my hope that uh, we, we see some incredibly radical changes in the infrastructure technology of wireless and in the business model surrounding wireless. Uh, and uh, I guess the only, the only thing I'd add to that is that if, if that doesn't come to pass and we've lost a great opportunity to really push, uh, to, to push humanity forward and to connect ourselves to each other. Well, I have nothing particularly smart to add, but I'll, <laughs> well, I'll, I'll borrow a line from uh, the movie Graduate, the future is uh, in wireless. <laughs> <laughs> see that part of it. Okay, so thanks very much to the panel.